Welcome to Preaching That Matters. A place you can find apostolic Pentecostal preaching. A place where all generations can be fed with the Word of God. We hope you enjoy. Our God is one made it very difficult for them to accept a physical representation of God. But Simon Peter said, I get it. You, you are Christ, the Son of the living God. And in, in verse 18, And I also say unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. There's a lot of good preaching throughout this whole passage. I can't cover it all today. And I will give, I want to focus on verse 19, and I will give unto thee the what? Keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. The keys to the kingdom of heaven. If there are keys to the kingdom of heaven, that means that there is a way to be locked out. Am I right? Well, I think it's important, important to know how to get in to the kingdom of heaven. Because there will be people, forgive me for being so blunt, but there will be people under the sound of my voice right now that will be locked out of the kingdom of heaven. I'm just saying, the amount of people we have in here, there's gonna be somebody come to the door and not be able to get in. But I'm gonna tell you how today, all right? Let's pray together in Jesus' name. Lord, I pray that you touch each of our hearts, Lord. I pray, God, as we reach, Lord, for souls today, for each of our hearts, Lord, we want to, we want to see you face to face. We want to make it to heaven, God. We want to be saved, Lord. That's more than just some rhetorical uh, fact, Lord. It's, it's more than signing some card, Lord. I pray in Jesus' name that you would help us literally, not just, not just feeling good in this service today, but literally make it to see you face to face in heaven. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus thank the Lord. Would you just tell the Lord individually for yourself, I want to make it to heaven and see you face to face. In Jesus name, I want to be in the kingdom. In Jesus name, thank the Lord. Thank the Lord. Praise God. God bless you. You may be seated. Everybody say, unlocking the kingdom. Unlocking the kingdom. You know, if you look at the passage uh, of Scripture that we read, then it involves keys. It involves an unlocking process. Now, uh, when I was in college, I worked at Jamestown Mall. And uh, I was working at a clothing store there, apartment store there. And one night I came out to my car and I put my key in my car. Brother James, I'm so glad to see you, although I can't say your name in the microphone, but I, I, I love this guy, man, James and Meredith. But, but Bro, I went to my car and I put my key in and it didn't work. And I was frustrated. I was a teenager. I, I, I needed to get to where I needed to get, man. I mean, there were things to do. And usually, you know, I, I'm kind of nocturnal. I was probably meeting somebody at Steak and Shake or something. And, and, you know, when it's time to go, it's time to go. And so I was fooling around with his key and it would not open my car for anything. And I thought... 
someone has messed with my car. And I'm looking around for security. I'm looking for help. I'm, I, you know, I didn't, we didn't have cell phones. It was more like Morse code back then and <laughs> telegraph systems. But um, I, I, I didn't have any way really to contact anybody. And I'm frustrated and I'm, I'm, I'm locked out of my car and I can't figure out what's going on. And this, I was there about 30 minutes trying to figure out what to do next. And, and then I, I, I looked over about four cars over. <laughs> Someone had moved my car, bro. And it was same make and model, same interior, you know, as far as I could see. Uh, ironically, when I went to that car and put my key in, it worked like a charm, and and I, I got to go home instead of spending the night in the parking lot there. Uh, that's a bad feeling, isn't it? You ever been locked out of the house? Or... That's miserable, isn't it? But the Anthony sister, Lysandra, out of town, so I can talk about them today. Um, just kidding, but they had my demon possessed dog before it was mine. And uh, it was their dog first. Be careful what your kids give you. Yeah. I was on the phone with him one time when he lived in Chicago and he said, hang on just a second. I think I was the one that was on the phone with him. I, I, I remember the story vividly. And, uh, he, he said, I got I to gotta run out and, uh, outside and get the mail or something. So he, he uh, went outside and, and, and I hear him, you know, and then he went to go back inside and that demon possessed dog had shut the door on him <laughs> and it was locked and Lysandra was at work and, and he was standing out in the yard and that dog did not know how to get up there and unlock That is a tough situation in the middle of Chicago. It's not like there's a locksmith next door that can get you in. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if they had a second key. I think they had to, you know, get somebody to come and, and change the locks or whatever. What an ordeal. Doesn't that just aggravate you? Have you ever locked your cars, keys in the car where they're running? Come on, show of hands. Oh, my goodness. That's a miserable feeling. You're running out of gas. Maybe it's cold outside. It's terrible. This is a universal problem, it sounds like. I'm glad to know I'm not the only person that's had lapses of judgment in the room here. But, you know, um, that's one thing, to get locked out of the car for a few minutes. This is why... I signed up for AAA 25 years ago. They can come and let me in my car. And uh, it's, it's, it's worth it in the long run, especially if you have a car with a lot of miles on it. Um, but we're not talking about getting into the house or getting into the car. We're talking about the kingdom of heaven. Now, it's one thing to be locked out of the house for a few minutes and, and, and are locked out of your car waiting for a second set of keys from somebody or whatever, or even a locksmith. But heaven? That's nothing to fool around with. But what, I want you to just back up and think in a, in a primary way at the, at, the, at the core of the thought here. What keeps people out of heaven? What keeps people out of the kingdom of heaven? You know, now, some have said that this passage could perhaps refer that the kingdom, uh, keys to the kingdom may have referred to Peter opening the kingdom to various groups of people. I understand 
that that is a very real possibility. He opened it to the Jews in Acts 2 and verse 3. He opened it to the Samaritans in Acts chapter 8. He opened it to the Gentiles in Acts chapter 10. So that's a plausible idea. I'm not going to try to stretch the metaphor too far because you get in trouble when you stretch the metaphor too far. But I don't really, this is just me. This is, everybody say this is pastor's interpretation. You, you're free to take it or leave it, okay? Now listen. I don't see the door opening necessarily to other people's. I feel like the door is entrance into the kingdom of heaven. So on the other side of the door to me is the kingdom of heaven not the Samaritans. If that is the case, then you, you see, uh, although Peter was reaching out to these people, I see him bringing them to the door and showing them how to get in. Locks are usually not on the inside. Right? They're on the outside. So Peter's reaching to these people on the outside of the kingdom saying, I know how to get in. Jesus gave me the keys to the kingdom. So the lost bringing them and, and locks keep people out. Right? Man, I'm telling you, um, it's a good question. What keeps people out of the kingdom? Here's a good question for you today. What could be keeping you out of the kingdom? Let's not shovel it over to somebody else. Says, oh man, I wish so-and-so was here today. I, that message, I'm going to buy the CD for them. Let, what could be keeping you, you, out of the kingdom. I don't know about you, but I want to be in the kingdom of heaven. That's simple. I understand now we're not talking about, this isn't hypothetical today. Right? We're not talking about how, you know, I can get up here like Joel Osteen or somebody else say, oh, bless God, I know how to make you Mondays happier. You know? <laughs> Drink coffee. All right. Yeah. That's not what we're talking about today. We're talking about heaven or hell. All right. Talking about where you're going to spend eternity. That's pretty weighty. That's pretty heavy. I'm here to make sure that somebody knows the kingdom of heaven is closed unless you unlock it. Yeah. Now, I, 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 I'm going to just... <laughs> <laughs> ah, I'm just going to wade into our culture for a minute. Brother Rod, I love you being here, man. You're f faithful and I, I'm glad to see you here today. But Brother Rod, let me tell you straight up, universalism is a false doctrine. What's universalism? There's a bunch of people today that believe everybody, even the people in hell, including Satan and his angels, will eventually be converted and go to heaven. You think I'm making it up? There's a bunch of books out there about it now. Rob Bell, all this goofy false doctrine, wrote a book called Love Wins and believes that the verse that says he's not willing that any should perish means that nobody will perish. He ain't going to take your choice away from you. Why would he give Peter the keys if he didn't need to use them? Can you answer me that? What keeps people out of the kingdom? We saw this week the, the, the Boston bombing. It showed you two things. 
that there are good people that will spring into action and help and become heroes in a moment's notice. And I love that about the goodness of humanity. But it also reminded us of the darkness of human hearts. And let me tell you something, there is a dark side of the human heart. The Bible said it's wicked. What is important to understand is that there are locks. How do we do on our deal? There are locks on the human heart. I want to talk about the first lock. You, let me tell you what will keep you out of the kingdom of God. Self. I'm going to tell you something. Self is going to send probably more people to hell than the devil will. Oh, man. You feel what I feel? I'm, I'm t- yeah, we're right down here where the rubber meets the road. Pride? I don't need God. I, I, what do I need? I'm a good person. I, I'm not the Boston bomber. I'm not, I, 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 I don't lie much. I don't, I don't, I'm a, I'm a decent person. I'm hanging out here with all these people dressed up, looking nice. And I'm telling y'all look, they got good smiles and you smell pretty good and everything else. It's, it's a decent place to be, but I got to tell you, I'm not making any predictions right now about who's going to make it to heaven or not. Cause I can't judge that from the cover. You can sit in church your whole life and go to hell. You know why? Because you can sit in church and never unlock the self. You can sit in church and worship along with everybody else and you can sing the songs and you can clap on beat and still be so full of yourself that it's going to keep you out of heaven. It's going to keep you out of the kingdom of heaven. You've got to get past Self. Everybody say self. Point to yourself and say, I have got to unlock myself. I like what Ray Ortland wrote. He said, basically he said, you and I do not come to God as an integrated, unified, whole person. Our hearts are multi-divided. It's like we have a boardroom in every heart. Imagine a big table, leather chairs, coffee, bottled water, a white board, a committee sits around the table in your heart. There's a social self, there's a private self, there's the work self, there's the sexual self, there's the recreational self, there's the religious self and others. The committee's arguing and debating and voting, constantly agitated and upset. Rarely... Can they come to a unanimous, wholehearted decision? We tell ourselves we're this way because we're so busy with so so many responsibilities. But the truth is, we're just divided and unfocused and hesitant and unfree. That kind of person can come to God in two ways. Listen, one is to invite him onto the committee. Give him a vote to. Then he just adds the complication. The other way is to come to God and to say to him, my life isn't working. Please come in and clean house. And fire my committee, every last one of them, and I'm giving myself over to you. I am your responsibility now. Run my life. Run my life. Now be honest. You got a committee? Or is is he the only one in the boardroom? Oh, man. 
I feel that. That hurts, don't it? Truth is, you got to win the battle over self or you're not going to make it to heaven. <laughs> I'm just doing my job. I, I'm, I'm one of these guys that don't think pastoring is just about eating fried chicken. It's about getting people to heaven. That's the kind of preaching that'll get you to heaven. It makes you look at yourself and say, is there a committee in there? Am I still just playing around with God? Is God just sitting on the committee saying, I got a suggestion. Why don't you pray? Why don't you submit your life to me? And then his voice gets drowned out by all the others. You got to fire the committee. And you know what that is? That's repentance. If you want to unlock the lock of self, you have got to repent. That's what Peter said on the day of Pentecost. He had the keys. You got to conquer that pride. You got, to get in the kingdom, you got to admit you're wrong. Boy, that's hard, isn't it? Especially with your spouse. Isn't it? That one guy wrote about it. He said, man, I was... I was driving down the road and we were going to Chicago or something and, 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 and I, I, we were supposed to be going to Chicago, but I, I kept seeing signs that said St. Louis, you know, and, and, and I thought, I thought, yeah, I can't admit I'm wrong. So he just kept driving, you know, over the speed limit and his wife keeps saying, I think we're going the wrong way. We can't be going the wrong way. I know what I'm doing. You're a backseat driver. Please be quiet. And he wrote down his thoughts and he said, I was thinking, I have got to find a way for this highway to make a U-turn without me exiting because I would be admitting that I was wrong and I don't want to admit that I'm wrong. Is there any men in the house that would get a, a witness from right there that it's hard. It's just hard. <laughs> Lift his hand up. That's all right. Yeah. It's like that. It's like those guys that went to heaven. There was two lines, one for henpecked and the other one for non henpecked husbands. And, 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 and the non henpecked husbands had one guy in the, in the line, and they all ask him, said, what are you doing over there? He said, my wife told me to stand here. <laughs> but you know what? Just like that guy driving down the highway, trying to figure out how to turn. You know, it's our pride that says, I can't admit I'm wrong. You know what? If you're going to come to God, you're going to have to swallow your pride and say, I'm sorry. I can't work this out on my own. I don't have what it takes. I don't have the wisdom. I don't have the knowledge. I don't have the power. I don't know what to do with my life. I'm going to fire the committee and say, Lord, be the Lord of my life. And Peter said on the day of Pentecost, you've got to repent. You've got to say, I'm going to turn around from my way and I'm going to go your way. You want to get into the kingdom, you got to unlock the self and give it to God. You got to desire change. Paul said, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but he's living in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith of the Son of God. How do you repent? Well, it's accompanied by a heavy heart. Paul said, godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation. I got to tell you, the reason some people don't receive the Holy Ghost or don't receive repentance in this way is because they're really not sorry. Right? I pray God help us feel the weight of our choices. If people could feel the weight of their choices, they could feel the weight of what, what they're doing at work. If, if they could feel the end result. Oh, and, and when we pray in the altar, 
we're not messing around. This isn't some kind of small infraction. Sin will keep you out of heaven. Am I right? Sin will, it will lock the door if, if, if you don't get yourself submitted to Almighty God. I've already gone on to the second one. The lock of self will keep you out. The lock of sin will keep you out of heaven. Robert Weber was traveling on a plane from San Francisco to Los Angeles a few years ago. And, and uh, he was sitting next to the window. He was reading some Christian book. And a man next to him that was uh, obviously from the Eastern Hemisphere, he asked him, Are you a religious man? And, well, yes, Robert said. I am too, he responded. They began to talk about religion in the middle of the conversation. Robert asked him, Can you give me a one-liner that captures the essence of your faith? Well, that... May not be a great question, but it, it was his question. And he said, well, yes. He said, uh, here was his one line. We are all part of the problem, and we are all part of the solution. Well, he said, we talked about his one-liner, a statement that uh, he felt was somewhat helpful. And he said, after a while, I, I said, would you like a one-liner that captures the Christian faith? He said, sure. Here it is. We're all part of the problem, but there's only one man who is the solution, and his name is Jesus. You cannot save yourself. I don't care what you try to do good in the earth. Your good works won't save you. You need a Calvary in your life. Sin will send you to hell. You cannot pay for your own sins. Sin will keep you out of the kingdom. You cannot work your way to heaven. You cannot be good enough to get to heaven. You can't make enough cookies for the missionaries to get to heaven. You have got to come to an altar and repent of your sins. And you got to go down in the water like Sue did a while ago so that your sins can be washed away. That's why he died at Calvary. He's the only one that can do that. That's the key. Peter said repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Sins has to be, have to be erased not just forgiven. It's not just a decision for Christ. His blood must be applied to your heart. Hebrews 9, 22, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. Mark 16, 16, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. This goes right along with what we're, we're teaching on Wednesday night. To be a part of God's covenant, you've got to be baptized in Jesus' name. I mentioned Wednesday night, just like Noah uh, was saved by water. The Bible says uh, in 1 Peter 3, 21, the like figure whereunto even baptism doth also now save us. Not the putting away of the filth of the flesh. It's not just to get cleaned up uh, physically, but the answer of a good conscience toward God. What happens when you go down in water in Jesus' name is that he washes your sins away. And all of a sudden you don't have a past. All you have is a future. It's been buried just like Jesus was buried. We are buried with him in baptism so that we can rise to walk in a newness of life that's covenant initiation that's covenant initiation when God spoke to Abraham come out outside he said he didn't even have any kids at that point he said come outside look at the stars try to count the stars one two three four five that's a tall order try to count the stars wow your, your children, your ancestors are going to be like the sand of the sea and, and like the stars of the heaven. And I, I like to think of the sand, Brother Donnie, as natural descendants of Abraham from the Jewish nation. But I like to think of the stars that, 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 that are not from the earth but are up in the heavens. Those are the spiritual sons that, and daughters that are born into the kingdom of God. And you know what? The tie together is in the Bible because just like Abraham had a covenant and you had to be circumcised to be in the covenant of Abraham. If you look at the Old Testament, Genesis 17 
tells about it. But in the New Testament, it says the covenant is spiritual. In Colossians, beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit. A lot of that going around. After the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power, in whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, in putting off of the body the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. What is that? Buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God who raised him from the dead. And you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened or made alive together with him, having forgiven all your trespasses. That's what happened. I got into the covenant of Abraham when I went down in Jesus' name. A covenant with Almighty God. And the door opens to the kingdom. Self will keep you out of the kingdom. Sin will keep you out of the kingdom. Satan will keep you out of the kingdom. But you know what the Bible said? We were dead in trespasses and sin, but in time past, you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation and passed in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But God, who is rich in mercy, somebody hear me, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quick and us together with Christ by grace are ye saved and he raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus that in the ages to come you might show the exceeding riches of his grace and kindness toward us through Jesus Christ for by grace are ye saved through faith and that not of yourselves God gave it to you how are you going to conquer Satan in your life I'm telling you something Satan is a formidable foe I know that self keeps a lot of people out of heaven, but the devil's working on you too. How many of you believe that? Is there anybody the devil's ever tried to discourage you, keep you back? Well, here's the good news. There's a key for that too. <laughs> I said there's a key for that too because before I didn't have power, but now greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. What are you saying? Peter was given the keys to the kingdom. Repentance will unlock the self and let you into the kingdom. It'll conquer that. And baptism is going to take care of the sin problem. But let me tell you something. If you want power over Satan, you need to be filled with the gift of the Holy Ghost. That is what gives you power. Somebody yell power. Say it again. Power. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That's what Acts 1.8 said. Ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me. Let's stand together. Hallelujah. He that believes on me as the scripture has said. Out of his belly is going to flow rivers of living water. Mm. What's keeping you out of the kingdom? What's keeping you out of the kingdom? Is it yourself? Is it sin? We can take care of that today. Is it Satan? God's more powerful than Satan, but you need to be filled with his spirit. Bible says if you don't have the spirit of Christ, you're none of his. Now I understand. You know, there's 600 million people that speak in tongues today. They say worldwide. That's a broad brush, okay? That's a broad brush. It's not unheard of to speak in tongues. But let me tell you something. It is not common to hear anymore that it is essential to be filled with the Holy Ghost to make it to heaven. 
That's not very common anymore. Can I tell you emphatically today? Jesus, or Peter, when he preached on the day of Pentecost and he, he had the keys in his hand. When he's unlocking heaven for people and the kingdom of heaven for people, you got to repent. Be baptized in Jesus' name. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. The promise is unto you and to your children and them that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. That includes St. Charles, St. Louis. Doesn't it? What's keeping you out of the kingdom? I love this story. I've, I've kept it throughout my ministry. Max Lucado wrote about it. Young girl, Christina, longing to leave her poor Brazilian neighborhood. She wanted to see the world. She was discontent with a home having only a pallet on the floor, a wash basin, a wood burning stove. She dreamed of a better life in the city. One morning she slipped away, breaking her mother's heart. Knowing what life on the streets would be like for her young, attractive daughter, Maria hurriedly packed to go find her. On the way to the bus stop, she entered a drug store to get one last thing pictures she sat in the photography booth and closed the curtains and spent all the money that she had outside of her bus fare on pictures of herself with her purse full of small black and white photos she boarded the next bus to Rio de Janeiro Maria knew Christina had no way of earning money she also knew that her daughter was too stubborn to give up. When pride meets hunger, a human will do things that before were unthinkable. Maria knew this and she began her search. Bars, hotels, nightclubs, any place with a reputation for street walkers or prostitutes. She went to all of them. At each place, she left her picture taped on a bathroom mirror, tacked on a hotel bulletin board, fastened to the corner of a phone booth. On the back of each photograph, she wrote a note. Wasn't long before the money and the pictures both ran out and Maria had to go home. Weary mother wept as she got on the bus and it began its long journey back to her small village. It was a few weeks later that young Christina descended the hotel stairs. The young face was tired, her brown eyes no longer danced with youth, but spoke of pain and fear. Her laughter was broken, her dream had become a nightmare. A thousand times over, she had longed to trade these countless beds for her secure pallet. Yet the little village was in too many ways, too far away. As she reached the bottom of the stairs, her eyes noticed a familiar face. She looked again and there on the lobby mirror, a small picture of her mother. Christina's eyes burned and her throat tightened as she walked across the room. She removed the small photo. She turned it over. Written on the back, it said, whatever you've done, whatever you've become, it doesn't matter. Please come home. God's ready. What's keeping you out? I think today would be a good day for somebody to repent of their sins. I think today would be a good day. It's already been a good day. Sue's been baptized in Jesus' name, had her sins washed away. You can receive the Holy Ghost today. The keys are here. Peter gave them to us. 
I want to open up this altar. I'd like for everybody to find a place to pray. Jesus is in this house right now. God's made a way. The keys are here. He's waiting on you. He's waiting on you. Come on, it's time to fire the committee. It's time to give your heart to him exclusively. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. I want to see you face to face. Doesn't matter what you've done. Doesn't matter what you've become. Just come home. Please come home. You know what Christina did? She came home that day. She came home. Will this be the day that you come home? Would you open up your spirit? Come on, let's talk to the Lord. Hallelujah. He's here. He's here right now. In the name of Jesus. Jesus be the Lord of God, I don't want myself to keep me out. I don't want myself to keep me out, God. I want to submit myself to you today. I want to repent. I want to surrender my life to you. Again today, Lord, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus.